Welcome to this session of Zen Golf Questions and Answers. It's nice to see everyone. What I'm going to do is begin by letting everybody unmute themselves. And if you have any questions, we can start right out with that. Uh, oh, the background behind me uh, is Bandon Dunes. I think this is the Pacific Dunes course. There are several courses there. I will be going up to Bandon Dunes, leading a group with the Shivas Irons Society. Uh, it's a group of people who are fans of the book Golf in the Kingdom. Uh, when playing these courses and doing some meditation. I'll be leading some meditations with them uh, before and even during the rounds. One of the things we like to do is play one hole uh, per nine usually uh, that we play silently. And you really discover a lot when you hit a great shot and there's nobody says anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it may be what the players on the PGA Tour were experiencing when there were no fans, you know, they're so used to that. It's, it's very interesting. And then because you're not saying anything, you realize how many thoughts you're generating. So it, it's a very interesting experience. Um, I also just got back from a really nice place. Let's see if you can see this. Called, oh, there we go, called Pebble Beach. Ooh, nice. uh, I was uh, very fortunate to be invited to speak at a fundraising uh, tournament for, uh, it's called the Parker Invitational, and it was for blood-related, particularly rare diseases. Uh, this pro has hemophilia, and he was uh, told that that most likely he was not going to be able to play uh, any sports and may not even live very long. And he beat the odds and actually played professional golf and is still teaching golf. So it's um, it was really amazing. And a company named CSL Bering, B-E-H-R-I-N-G, was the sponsor for the program and their whole project is developing uh, medicines for rare diseases. So it was very, it was very inspiring. I hope I'll be able to do that again next year for them. So um, any questions that you have, that you're bringing to the program? If not, I'll share some things with you. I see an, uh, Andy Lacombe. Hi, welcome, Andy. You can unmute yourself if you'd like. Marcella. Marcella, Marcy. Hi, Marcy. Joey, hello. May I have a question? I'm struggling um, with the paths. Um, uh, so far, I'm struggling most of all with short paths. Mm -hmm. um, there are two ways I've been thinking about uh, today actually I kept the score like the notes no I, I kept the notes uh, just writing down if if, uh, if if it's if it was okay or if it was short actually eight times I was very short for whatever reason I'm afraid to hit the ball uh, to pat actually to the hall or behind the hall mm -hmm. uh, trying to imagine uh, to hit the back of the of the hall mm -hmm. or sometimes i'm trying to just imagine oh no there is no hall it's a, it's a one meter mm -hmm. behind the hall and i'm just trying okay is can there I, anything can... else yes no, i could we, like we approach yeah, yeah. Let's, let's work on that. Okay. So first of all, um, <clears throat> the trying is an interesting word in there. As you, you probably guessed, I was going to say. Um, and what you're trying to do is figure out how to put the ball in the hole. 
correct? Yes. That's not your job. That's what the problem is. Your job is just to get the ball started. Now, because you're concerned and trying to put it in the hole, one of the things that I observed when people uh, leave a lot of putts short, uh, it is a kind of protection from feeling badly, from feeling bad, <laughs> from feeling bad after the putt. Because if you left it short, you feel like I didn't really miss it. It just never got to the hole. But if it goes by, you can't really convince yourself that you didn't miss it because you missed it. Now, it's helpful to know that you didn't miss it, the ball missed the hole. It's a famous comment that Jack Nicholas made when some when he said, uh, I've, I've never missed one of those putts that was, you know, under pressure inside five feet. And somebody said, I saw you, it was on this hole at this date on this golf course. And he said, oh, that, no, I, I made the putt, the ball missed the hole. So we have to separate those two things out. Now, so understand that, and, and it's helpful to tell yourself, I, my job is to get it started. If it goes by the hole, it goes by the hole. If it goes in, it goes in. But I need to focus on what I can control. Because especially if you're focused tightly on the hole, um, this is something that I, I uh, heard from a teacher named Fred Shoemaker. When you look at the hole, everything gets, it looks shorter than it actually is. And so one of the techniques that you're using of hit, looking past the hole is one of the ways that you can do that. But, but another is just to open up your vision and not look at a particular point past the hole, but just see that there's room past there. Now, that still may not be enough uh, because if you're uptight about whether it's gonna go in or not, all your muscles tighten up and it's hard to make a free stroke. And so that may be, it may be like you're trying to, to run the car with the gas pedal and the brake on at the same time. Okay. So to start with, what I would suggest is to, do you make a practice stroke, Marcy? Yes. Yes. Always. Make your practice stroke and hold the finish and say, will that reach the hole? And if you say, yeah, that'll reach the hole, then you say, then my job is to make my stroke and get to the same finish. So now you have a, even a different job, even than getting the ball started. It's moving the putter through the ball to that finish. And if you do that, then you'll see, oh, okay. Um, you might be a little scared on the first time you do it because it'll really go farther than you expect it to because you're not making that tentative little guidey stroke, but you're making a confident stroke because all you're trying to do is get to that point this far in front of the ball, right? And you go, boom, and it goes. You go, oh, that actually put a truer roll on it. Um, especially on shorter putts, Distance is not really, it's not like you're trying to gauge the distance on a 30 foot putt and get a feel for that. They're usually, if they're downhill, you give it a gentle little roll. If they're uphill, you give it a little firmer, but it's not that hard from two meters away to, to judge the distance. So another thing you can do um, is, do you put a line set up with the line on the ball pointing to your, where you want it to go in on, you know, like left yes. center of the hole. Um, on the practice green, set some balls with the lines on top like that and try to make them roll so the line stays sharp. Then your job on those short putts is to roll it so that the line stays sharp. And that will take your thoughts of whether it's going to go in the hole or not out of your mind. So try those different things. Okay.
Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Mike? Uh, Joe, you wrote in Zen Golf um, how it can be beneficial for us to set aside our preconceived notions about the numerical value of par that's mm -hmm. written on the scorecard and instead play to your own par, um, right. you know, your own personal par. You talk about that a lot. Uh, couldn't it also be helpful to uh, do the same thing sort of and set aside our preconceived notions also about tea boxes and their colors and their uh, traditional, the way they're traditionally represented. Uh, yes, very much so because, um, you know, in the traditional way, it was uh, rather sexist in that this is the men's tees, the ladies tees, and then the championship tees, you know, and now, we, now sometimes there are five tee boxes. Mm -hmm. Uh, and 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 now they've they're not putting that on the scorecard anymore, as as far as uh, in many places. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I imagine there are still in some that are there, but oh, then yes. you have the the creative ones. Oh, Jenny, I love that cup. Hold the cup up. Yeah. Okay. So then you have your turquoise teas, your yes. navy teas, your magenta teas, your emerald teas, your orange teas, you know, your, we've in California, we even have the avocado teas, you know, so thank you. So, so um, the, what I do, which I think you might find really interesting and fun to do, okay, uh, follow some uh, tournament on TV and write down what clubs the pros are using on par fours, par threes, par fours, and par fives, okay? Now, once you've written those down, next time you go out to the golf course, kind of move those numbers around to kind of match the holes on your, your course. And you go to a par four and you say, okay, so the pro teed off with the three wood and then hit an eight iron. Okay, my three wood goes 200 yards and my eight iron goes 130 yards and that's 330. So I'm going to tee it up in the fairway th 330 yards from the hole and play my three wood and hopefully <laughs> I'll reach my distance and play an eight iron in and see how well you do when you're playing the same clubs that the pros are playing, because they did have a pro do the opposite. And he had to play a course using the, they, they obviously they couldn't do it with the, the drives, but they put him in the fairway at his distance for the club that a 10 handicapper was using on the golf course. And he said, if I had to play these shots into every green, I wouldn't just stop being a pro. I wouldn't play golf. That's no fun. So, so what they think, what they think is golf is not the same game we play. I, I, was, I was coaching at the U.S. Open at Con Congressional. And... Um, Tim Petrovic, he said, this is a, it's a par four. And he said, oh my God, I have a four iron in on a par four. What are they thinking? And I went, boo hoo, you poor thing, have four iron. I have three woods in on par fours and, and four hybrids, not just four, you know, <laughs> you're, you're really making me feel sorry for you there, pal. But, that, but he regarded it as inappropriate that you would have that long a shot in on a par four. Okay, and the game has changed because that wasn't inappropriate 50 years ago when golfers were playing. But the, the game has changed a lot. And now it's, those distances are so different. Um, very often college teams will have their 
uh, the players play from the front tees. And so you're going to play from these tees until you can score, and then we'll move you back. And, and they often find it harder because, ironically, when you're playing from the further back tees, sometimes you can't reach the trouble that's out there, the bunkers in the fairway. But then you have a much longer shot into the green. So I think that it's really good to try those experiments and let go of your preconceived notions of what tee boxes you're from. I, I actually talk about that in Zen Golf that one uh, guy actually self-sabotaged and played higher scores on his last few holes because he was afraid that if he shot a lower score, they would make him move back to the blue tees instead of the white tees. And he and he didn't. He was very successful in the white tees, and he didn't think he could do it from the blue tees. So it's a very interesting concept. We we lay all these concepts over everything. Good. Andy, do you have any questions? You can unmute yourself, or you can, if you don't want to, you can write it into the chat. Section. Yeah, can you hear me? Oh yeah, hi. I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't get to it before. Um, I, I have a really strange thing that's been going on. I've been playing the best golf of my life, but I'll go through a round and like this past Sunday, I, I was two over and I had at least 12 putts. I, I made nothing. I had at least 12 putts that finished within, oh, maybe six inches of the hole but I, I cannot get them to go. And, and there'll be putts that are, I hit them exactly the way I want. They're breaking, they look like they're going straight in the heart. They'll stop breaking and go over one of the lips, the high lip, the low lip. And I, I this has been going on for about a month. I, I can't make them, but I'm right there. Okay. Well, first we want to change the definition. You mean you're, you're having difficulty holding them? Yes but you're making them. In other words, yes. you're getting them started exactly the way that you want to. So my first guess is that you're not quite picturing them correctly. Now, those putts that stop breaking are most likely downhill putts. Yes. And that is because what downhill putts do, downhill breaking putts, break gently toward your target, but then once they hit the fall line, and the fall line is that, um, that path or line, that direction that a ball would roll straight down, gravity, right? And okay. so what they do is when they hit the fall line, they don't turn anymore. Those are like a river that gradually, uh, a stream that gradually turns until it hits the main river and then goes straight down towards the ocean. So what you need to see is you need to really find that fall line. You can stand below the hole uh, with your feet straddling the, the through line. <clears throat> and say, is it pushing me to one side or the other? And slide over until it's really not pushing you from one side or the other. And that's, that's the angle at which the hole will receive the ball coming straight in. So you want to find a little spot in front of the, the hole. Really fast putts, you might be actually two or three feet out from the hole that you're just trying to get it to that spot and then just keeps rolling straight down into the hole. But it won't keep curving. That's why sometimes you see in a tournament the, the, the ball straightens out and the pro's going, what? Why didn't it keep turning? It didn't keep turning because it found the fall line. And once it find, the ball finds the fall line, it doesn't want to turn. It wants to go straight. So are you then putting to the point on the fall line where the break stops? And, and that's what you're really putting to with a little bit more force to actually get it to the hole? Yes, exactly. And, um, okay. and if it's really steep downhill, you don't need much more force. Okay. Okay. Now, then the uphill putts are the opposite. 
if your your uphill putts probably just as they're about to go in the hole break off in front. Yeah, they'll hit the uh, I call it the volcano where they where they pull the hole cutter out and there's a little bit of a lip there. So if it doesn't have enough to get over it, it it's right. not going over. Now there that that happens either when they take the hole plug out, they don't press it down enough, and it's the uh, uh, the technical term is the hole is crowned, right? Volcano is fine too. Uh, <laughs> Peltz called it the lumpy donut because the other thing that happens is when people reach for their ball, they step a few inches, they put they put their foot a few inches from the hole, or they lean their on their putter. Why a guy the last week was doing that and he would put his putter right down on, on somebody's line and lean on it as he reached in to pull the ball out. Um, his nickname was Captain Oblivious. Uh, <laughs> but, um, the, the idea is that enough through the day of pressing down a few inches from the hole actually raises the ground up towards the hole. So you're, you're going through bumps and, and all of that. But, but that's not, re even if that wasn't there, even if that wasn't there, what's happening is the ball is acting like the water in a fountain. So this is the opposite image. And that is in a fountain, the water is powered. And so goes straight up until it loses speed. And then it wants to turn and go back to earth, whatever direction it's going to turn. So that ball is holding its line towards the hole. But if there's any slope at all, as it slows down, it will turn sharply. So the two solutions for that is to play for the sharp turn, which I do sometimes. And, and I'll actually pick a spot a couple inches to the right of the hole and try to hit it firm enough that it's going to reach that spot. Knowing that on the way to that spot, whoop, it's going to turn in. The other approach uh, is to say, well, I'm going to hit it firmly enough that it holds its line until it gets uh, into the hole. And that if it were, if the hole weren't there, it wouldn't start turning till afterward. Okay. That's a little risky on this, on especially on steep uphill putts, because what that means is if it does miss the hole, you might be a couple of feet by, and those aren't fun coming back. <laughs> no. Okay. So on the steeper uphill putts, I will play for that sharp turn. Okay. Yeah, I a different visual. One is like this, shoom, straight, 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 and then just the last foot or so sharp turn. The other one is gradual, gradual slope, and sometimes a foot or more before the hole straightening out. You have to see the different picture that way. Okay, that will that will help you. Now, the other thing is you, you, you might combine the two, which isn't helpful, and that is, well, I don't, want it, I, I don't want it to break off in front of the hole, so I'll aim outside and hit it further. And then you hit it through the break. Right. So re you really have to be decisive and make up your mind which, one, which approach you're going to take. OK. Another question, Christy, were you raising your hand or just waving? Well, I wanna share um, a couple of things that came up in the, uh, in the tournament. And one was the pro that was on our team was putting, he was so disappointed in his putting that he actually asked me for a tip after the second round of the tournament. Um, and what I found he was doing was getting tentative. So I, I said, hold the finish and hold your posture. Those two universals. 
that when the ball comes through the putt, and and I was talking, Marcella, I was talking to you about making that a commitment on your short putts to get to that finish and hold it. And that that's what he was struggling with was the short putts. And and that was get to the finish and hold it. And the quality of the roll and the uh, the pace at which it went in the hole with confidence rather than wobbling in at the last second was really, really noticeable. And he played his best round and uh, actually finished second in the tournament. So, so it made a big difference to hold that finish. And then the other is not to come up out of the putt as you're, as you're hitting it, but hold your posture. The other thing that I discovered, because I was doing that, but there, there still was a little bit of lack of feel of commitment to to the putts, and I went on the in the, the practice area, and I remembered one of my keys, and that was sometimes I start holding it too softly in my left hand, my my whole side hand. I'm a righty, so in my left hand, my lead hand, and I and when I firmed it up a little bit, wow, the roll really really improved. So I want to add that in as something that's really helpful. And when I mentioned that to him uh, that evening, that I, uh, at the closing dinner, he said, that triggered something that his coach from years ago had said, okay, let's work on three things. Keeping your head steady. Now that was the not lifting up out of it. Holding your finish and firming up your left hand. <laughs> so again, there were, they were things that he'd known earlier in his career and forgot about. So we brought those back in um, and it, those things really make a difference. Firm lead hand, hold the finish, maintain your posture. And one, one way to maintain your posture, if you, if you lift your head, your shoulders open up. You see what happened to my shoulders? But if I just turn my, my, my chin under to look, my shoulders don't move. Here's the difference. Roll the putt, lift to look, ooh, not so good. Roll the putt, turn under, no change in the shoulders. And, and you could say, well, if, you're, if you don't look if you don't lift to look until after the ball is gone, it doesn't really affect it. The problem is it, it creeps back in and we start to lift and look earlier and earlier and earlier and then it affects the stroke. Okay. Anything else or shall we close for today? Uh, Mike? Um, one more thing quickly, what you just mentioned about uh, lifting up and coming out of the putt before, you know, too soon. I see, and tell me, tell me if, you know, what you think about this. I see a lot of pros do this all the time in telecast. It's like as soon as the putter face hits the ball, they, they lift up and, and, and the putt doesn't go in. And so the announcers will say, well, that that pro, they knew as soon as as soon as they struck the ball that the putt wasn't going in. And sometimes I wonder if that's really true, or if if they lifted up right away because they knew the putt was was bad, or if the putt was bad because they lifted up too soon. It just started. They they that's, the, that's the putt head hits the hits the ball and they start walking. That that's a good question, and both actually happen. Because you'll hear in a tell, you know, sometimes they'll hit the putt and they say, I think he came out of that one a little bit. But what happens is they've struck the putt and instantaneously they know that they also came out of it and they just keep coming out. They just keep going because they know, oh, that's that. Right. Other times they hit it and they know they didn't get to their finish or they didn't. They didn't hit it with the conviction that they wanted and they know it doesn't have a chance. And then you have the third 
which I've seen Jordan Spieth do at least a couple of times a year, or actually more than that, where he hits the putt and then then starts walking in disgust, and to his surprise, it goes in <laughs> because because he he knows he mishit it, mm -hmm. but he also misread it, and that does does happen sometimes. Um, he comes out of him quite a lot because his particular stroke has a tendency to come through a little bit the heel leading and the face open. He misses short putts 90% of the time on the right side because of that. And it's, it's part of his stroke. And he knows what it feels like when he does it. He sees the ball leave and he sees that it doesn't leave on his line. And you can see that almost instantaneously. And, and that's why he comes up out of it. And then, and then as he's on his way out of it, he goes, oh, 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 that, oh, phew. You see the expression on his face, he almost goes like, phew got away with, I got away. You know he has that expression, like a little kid that got away with something. So um, all three of those kinds of things happen, but that's a very, very good observation. Uh, and sometimes they don't, but most of the pros know the second that they did come come up out of it. Um, not always, but most most of the time. For amateurs, we have no idea. And we think, man, I rolled that great putt. Why didn't it go in? What we what often happens is we hit the putt and we go, well, I didn't see that break there. Well, it's quite possible the break wasn't there. And I've rolled other putts and gone in. Sorry about that. I've I've rolled other putts and I've gone back and said, I really don't think there's that much break. Maybe it was my stroke. And I roll it with a good roll on it. The, you know, the, the first putt broke this much. The next one, that much. It was the quality of the stroke. So uh, good question. Good one to wrap up on. Thank you all so much. We will hopefully see you again in a couple of weeks. Uh, if you've been tuning into my book class uh, of, on Winnie the Pooh, one more class next week on Tuesday night. And uh, then we're going to conclude that one. But thank you all very much, and we'll see you in thank two you. weeks. Yep, yeah, lovely.